Today is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship with First Reformed United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. My name is Elizabeth Horton and I serve as one of the ministers of this congregation in Lexington, North Carolina. And we are delighted that you are here, whether you have been a longtime member or a recent friend. We're grateful that we are worshiping with you and pray that you will feel the spirit of love and God's community, even though we are separated by a screen. Today is October the 18th, and we're going to worship a bit differently than we have in weeks past. You see, today is Children's Sabbath Sunday. And so not only are our children and our young people going to lead us in worship, but we are going to explore a bit why Jesus spoke to the disciples and to the crowds when he was teaching and the crowds were gathered around him and in and among the crowds, the little children began to run. The little children began to move the adults aside, trying to get a glimpse, trying to get a moment with Jesus. The disciples were furious. The crowd tried to rope them off. But Jesus spoke these words. Let the children come to me. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For it is unto such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. Do not hinder them. Jesus told the disciples, Jesus told the crowds. And so even with the temper tantrums of toddlers, even with the egregious eye rolls of the tweens, even with the stubborn streaks that teenagers possess, Jesus said, let them come to me because it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And so today, let us look at what is it in this world that hinders our children? What is it that we are doing? What is it that is happening in our world, in our nation, in our cities, and in our communities that is hindering the children from becoming the precious and valued people that Jesus believes that they are what hinders the children from becoming, from transforming into who God is creating them to be. What hinders the children? And so let us let the children and the young people come and let us worship God together. Amen. Good morning. I am Jacob Hartle. I want to welcome you to this special service today at First Reform United Church of Christ. We especially welcome those who may be visiting with us. Today we are celebrating National Children's Sabbath. This day is sponsored by the Children's Defense Fund. Children's Sabbath celebration is a way for faith communities to celebrate children as gifts of God. It provides the opportunity of churches to renew and live out their responsibilities to care protect and advocate for all children. This celebration is part of a larger children's movement that hopes to unite communities and religious congregations of all faiths across the nation. 
We celebrate our shared concern for children and a common commitment in, to improving their lives and working for justice on their behalf. In doing this together, each action is bigger, more powerful, and more inspiring than the efforts of any one celebration. We hope this service will inspire each of us in your, I mean, to act on behalf of your, uh, of children in prayer and commitment and deeds. In your bulletin, you will find the announcements for this week. Now, let us turn our heart and minds to worship God. Let us pray. Gather us, O oh God. Bring us together to live with your love. Gather, gather our minds, O oh God, to, fo to focus on you and your children. There are wills, O oh God, to be strong and brave. Help us to seek just justice. Make us one in heart, mind, mind and spirit. as we worship you today. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. Almighty and ever loving God, our source of power and inspiration gives us strength and joy in serving you as followers of Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 7. Listen for God's word. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, 
I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And now let us pray the prayer of confession together. God of the infinite possibilities, we confess that too often we are stuck in what, <laughs> what is, rather than working towards what could be. We doubt we can make a difference, and so we just try to get through the day. We become overwhelmed by pain, problems, and the pandemic, and want to hide our hearts, sit on our hands, and wait for it to end. Forgive us, O oh God, for living too, too little in the largeness of your love. Fill us, fill us, we pray, with courage, compassion, vision, and determination. To embody your love, seek your will, and strive for justice that we will enable all children to, th to thrive and live with joy in the fullness of life that you intend. These things we pray in the name of your child, Jesus, amen. Hear the good news. Behold, I make all things new. Friends, by grace of God, may know in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. For passing of the peace, we're going to learn how to say peace be with you and also with you in American Sign Language. Peace, peace be, be with, with you and also with, with you. Let's do it again. Peace be with you and also Peace be with you. And also with you. In the Bible are the words of one of God's special helpers, we call Isaiah, who told people God's message. This Isaiah was speaking to families who were having a very hard time. Some of them were far from their homes, and everything seemed different from what they were used to. Some were hungry, or sick, or didn't have any work to do. Grown-ups and kids were feeling sad and scared. Isaiah told them that God's message was, Don't be scared. I have called you by name. You belong to me. God said, Even in during the scariest times, I will be with you. God has called each of us by name. You belong to God. God will always be with you. Then Isaiah told the people God had a hopeful message for them. God said, I am creating something new. There it is. Do you see it? God wanted the people to use their imaginations to try and see the new world that God was creating. But things would be better in a scary or hard time. Or hard time. God wanted people to see pictures in their minds of the world God wants. We've all been going through a hard time, kind of like the families Isaiah was speaking to. For lots of kids, school is different, and they haven't been able to play with their friends. Lots of people are getting worried about getting sick. Some parents don't have jobs anymore. Lots of us are upset when people are treated unfairly because of the color of their skin. I think God would like us to use our hopeful thoughts to imagine what it will be like when things are better and more fair for people, especially for children. Let's all close our eyes and imagine. I can imagine a time when all children can go to school 
safe schools and play with their friends. There it is. Can you see it? I can imagine a time when people aren't worried about getting sick and don't have to wear masks anymore. And anyone who is sick gets good care from a doctor. There it is. Can you see it in your imagination? I can imagine a time when parents have jobs in their homes and food for every family. There it is. Can you see it in your imagination? I can imagine a time when everyone is treated fairly and kindly, whatever color of skin they have, and everyone knows that all colors of skin are beautiful. There it is. Can you see it in your imagination? The world is different than the hopeful pictures we saw in our imaginations. But on the Children's Sabbath weekend, our church and people who love God everywhere are saying that they are going to be God's partners in helping create that hopeful future for all children. Let us end with a prayer. Dear God, thank you for promising us that you will always be with us, even during scary times. Thank you for reminding us that you are creating something new. Help us to keep using our imaginations to see a better world for all children. Thank you for our church on this Children's Sabbath that will be your partner in making our world better. Amen. Oh God, some of us come through this time from homes that have been too silent for so long. Others of us come from non-stop noise and days of distraction, whether from solitude or chaos, we long now to hear your words to us, for us. By the power of your spirit, give us the ears to hear, the hearts to feel, the spirits to respond to the word you have for this day. Amen. Join me for the prayers of the people. Let us pray. O oh God, you hear our prayers, whether we are young or old, rich or poor, bold or quiet, confident or not, whether the prayers are spoken aloud or whispered in our silence of our hearts. Hear us, each of us, all of us. God, hear our prayer. We pray that you will help us truly be your church by living into your upside down kingdom where the last are first and the least are lifted up. God of all, hear our prayer. We pray for our world, our whole huge hurting world, with the cavern stretching between the wealthy and the poor those with easy access to education and those for whom school is just a dream those whose childhood is a time of learning and play and those whose childhood is a time of work and worry who help us close those gaps with justice and compassion god of all hear our prayer we pray for ourselves for the love that embraces children for hope that presses us forward and seeking justice and faith that guides us. God of all, hear our prayer. These things we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our New Testament reading comes from Matthew twenty-two fifteen. Listen now for God's word. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples and along with the herald and his teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity, and you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the appeal of your tax this season or not? But Jesus, knowing your evil intent, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? So many coins were paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and asked him, whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left and went away. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
In the book of Isaiah, the prophet expresses outrage of the many injustices occurring in Israel. Time and again, he holds the people of Israel responsible for these injustices. During this time, the city of Judah was in ruins. Their temple has been destroyed. Additionally, the leader of Judah and most of the, of the public were exiled in Babylon. Despair was everywhere. The prophet declares that despite these failures, neither Yahweh nor his people have been defeated. Even though they had poorly treated needy people, God had a plan to restore them. Isaiah promised that God will use his people to bring righteousness, justice, and mercy to Israel. Throughout the scriptures, there are many themes that occur. The first theme centers around human sin and God's desire for justice. In the book of Isaiah, people's selfish actions are repeatedly pointed out. A new elite class de had developed and a gap between rich and poor had become enormous. Greed for material, possession, for material possessions blinded people while those who were poor became hungrier. Widows and orphans were mistreated. Innocent people were abused and many people were dishonest. Israel had developed a false sense of security. They wrongly believed that God loved them more and they were invincible. Isaiah made it clear that God desired Israel to turn from her selfish ways. God wanted Israel's people to return to justice and take care of their most vulnerable people. A second theme that exists in God cannot be stopped or controlled. The book of Isaiah showed us that God is interested in areas including society, economics, and politics. Additionally, he is very present in personal areas of prayer, friendship, fam and family life. God is the most powerful being, therefore neither humor, human nor their false idols can, can control or trump over him. No force of nature can compete with him. No display of greed, fear, or cruelty is stronger than God's ability to overcome it or create a true good from it. Because of his power, God can act in surprising ways and use unexpected events or people to teach God's people. Individuals who appear strange or foreign to us, like Cyrus, can be messengers of God, redemption, and God's blessing. The third theme that is presented in God's abiding love for his people. According to Isaiah, God sends his people into exile in order to discipline them. Regardless, he does not forsake them. God's actions in the scripture occur in order to restore Israel. Throughout her exile, God continues to work for Israel's transformation of being, of being a community of righteous people. Because of his love for them, God will never abandon his people. Our final or fourth theme from the scripture is the need to stand strong in the face of injustice. Since the time of Isaiah, when people were dealing with desperate situations, people have wondered whether forces of evil, bad luck, or blind fate has taken control of their lives. When, when violence or tragedy occurs, often good people ask if God has forsaken them. It is tempting and even understandable to give in to that despair. To this despair. This is a practice that still continues today. Regardless, as people of faith, we are still called upon to make a different choice. We are called upon not to give up, but to stand strong while we address the injustices. We are called upon to proclaim our Christian beliefs in order to work towards justice over evil. We are meant to imitate Isaiah's unyielding conviction that God's final plan is restored. When we resolve to persist, we are empowered to seek out the injustice that is presented in our communities and replace it with just and merciful options. As God exposes our failures, our trust in God allows us to use his tools of truth and justice to act out as agents of restoration. In our second scripture from Matthews, a group of Herod's supporters and Pharisees challenged Jesus with the question of paying Roman taxes. The people were pro-Roman and were very much in favor of the tax. The Pharisees deeply resented the Roman tax but accepted as a necessary evil. The Pharisees consult 
consoled their people to go along with the tax, but they viewed it as an unjust burden. The one thing both groups had in common was the strong dislike of Jesus' teachings. In the scripture, both, both groups tried to pu publicly place Jesus in a situation where he would have to tax a side, or take a side. Taking a side could have created quite a dilemma. If Jesus argued that the tax was unfair, he would be accused of showing an anti-Roman behavior. This is an offense that was punishable by Pilate. If Jesus supported the tax, he would lose popularity with much of the general public. For most of the um, Pharisees, the tax was an economic hardship and a hated reminder of their submission to Rome. Jesus did not allow himself to become trapped in the public setup. With the flip of a coin, Jesus breaks free of the traps meant to damage him and refocuses himself and his community on how to fulfill God's will. Instead of discussing the legal issues of their question, he moves the conversation in a different and much more profound direction. Jesus asked them, whose head is on the coin? His op opponents answered, Caesar's. A good paraphrase of Jesus' fi final reply to them was, then give to Caesar the things stamped in his likeliness that are Caesar's, and give, and give to God the things that are stamping, stamped in his likeliness that are God's. Jesus' response carries us all the way back to Genesis and the Garden of Eden, where we are taught that men and women were created in the image of God. With his smart answer, Jesus wants people to understand that just as coins stamped with Caesar's image belong to Caesar. Human beings stamped with God's image belong to God. Jesus is telling all of us that to treat Caesar's coins as Caesar would have them be treated, and to treat God's coins or human beings as God would want them to be treated. In Jesus' response, the question of taxes became a less important matter and his focus shifts to our responsibility to provide justice and mercy to God's people. The scripture teaches us that humans have value far greater than petty squabbles over taxes. Jesus pulls his audience back into considering the significance of men and women being minted in God's image. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeliness. If we accept that God's likeliness dwells within human beings, then we must also acknowledge that sacredness of all humans' life. Not just some of us, but all of us are sacred. Each child on this planet is of infinite value. Each child on this planet's stamped with God on this planet is stamped with God's image. Every child is beyond precious. Every child is valuable beyond our earthly ability to measure value. Now it is the time to put these two scriptures in perspective with how they relate to modern times. We also want to show how to promote children's Sabbath, theme of seeking justice and finding joy in hard times. Just as in the times of Isaiah, evil and the great divide among the classes exist. Unfortunately, the victims of this great divide are often children. Our nation allows millions of children to be hungry, homeless, uninsured, and abused. The Children's Defense Fund compiles shocking facts about the devastation in the lives of America's children. Among them are persistent hunger. Day after day, hunger affects the lives of 8.3 million American children. Deep poverty haunts the lives of 7.1 million children in our rich nation. Gunfire violence, suicides, accidents, and homicides take the lives of seven children a day. Some will respond to these facts with apathy or despair, but we as God's people know a better way. As people of faith with God's help, we can address the injustices that children face. We can help bring about change and restoration. Children's Sabbath is a good opportunity to reassess the needs of children in your church, community, and state. We as a congregation need to expand our knowledge and inspire our actions. 
We need to emulate persons such as Bishop Desmond Tutu, Dr. Martin Luther King, Mother Jr., Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi by becoming agents of transformation. Some of these were Christians, some, like Cyrus, worshipped other gods, but the presence of God in their lives were unmistaken, both. Like them, we need to call, be called to be God's agents in the world. We don't need to be perfect, we need to be perfectly ready to act. We are all called to participate in God's plan of compassionate restoration. God never forsakes us, and we need not forsake each other. It is the responsibility of every, per every person of faith to participate in God's restoration of the world. When we do God's will by acting with justice, mercy, and compassion, we end up changing lives for the better, often changing our own in the process. We are asking all of you today to look for additional ways that we can change the lives of children for the better. Prayer for justice. Let us pray. Almighty God, you created us in your image. Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Let us take his light from our sanctuary to our home and out into the world to do God's work and promote better lives for children. This is the light of my We have so beautifully seen the light of Christ shine in these children and in these young people. They are calling us to allow the light of Christ to shine through us in order to light the way for the many children and young people, the many families who are suffering in the shadows of this world. We are grateful to each of the children and to each of the young people for sharing your gifts with us this morning. We are grateful to Stacy Sosby West, who is the one who coordinated all the different pieces and parts of this service. And we are grateful to Ellen Peterson for the way that she masterfully took the myriads of videotapes that were sent to her and created such a beautiful video of worship. And so these young people have helped us to see the very real problems that are facing families and children in this day and age in our community and in our nation. These young people have helped us to hear the scriptures that remind us 
that we are called to nurture. We are called to protect. We are called to remove the obstacles that are in the way of the little ones. And so I invite you to think about how God is calling you in this very moment. How can you be a part of removing all that hinders the children in our world? And so as you go forth from wherever it is that you are right now, know that you are made in God's image. Know that you are precious and valued to God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, go forth in peace to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with God. Amen.